Good morning. Yeah, I'm Pastor Mark. Thanks for being here today. This is so awesome. Love hearing the kids sing, but you know what? I love hearing the kids uh, during the service, so don't worry about any noise or playing or chatting. It's great. We love it. We welcome it. Uh, We are doing a series that we just started called The Story, and the story is, uh, it's the Bible kind of abridged, so it reads like a novel. It's super easy to read. Um, and we just started it, so if you want to jump in, you're not far behind, just a few chapters, maybe 40 pages of reading. You could catch up and you could follow us through the school year. So we're going to, together as a church family, we're just going to read through the Bible this school year. Something a lot of people want to do, but it's so intimidating, it's so big, uh, but we can, we can do it together and actually have a lot of fun. It's pretty amazing stuff. Uh, we've just finished, really, the first book in the Bible, Genesis, and we're moving into the next book, which is one of my favorites. It's Exodus. Exodus was actually really one of my favorite uh, books I would read when I was younger. I'd go to the chapters at the beginning that talked about all the plagues that God sent in Israel, like zap, bang, you know. God is like tough. He's like kicking butt and taking names. I still love Exodus, the story of deliverance, but it's for a much different reason today. <laughs> I'm older. It's because I see throughout the whole book That God is working to deliver his people in spite of his people. Like, God's not constrained by their low expectations. He's not constrained by their skepticism. He does what only he can do. Time and time again, he miraculously delivers his people. So the end of Genesis, Joseph uh, dies in Egypt Now, uh, many generations have died in Egypt, but the Israelite nation has grown great in population. But the people are probably starting to wonder if God had forgotten the second part of that promise that he made to them, that it will make you great in number, but also make you great, a great nation. Uh, Because as they lived in Egypt uh, over the centuries, generations, uh, the, the, the Egyptians became very concerned about them and made them slaves. So for many generations now, this whole nation of people are slaves to the Egyptian people. And they are, of course, crying out to God to remember his promises to them and to come and deliver them, to rescue them. Well, there was a really good candidate to take them out of Egypt, to help them out. His name was Moses. But that was a good option 40 years ago, okay, when he was a prince of Egypt. See, since then he had committed murder. He'd been on the run. At this point in time, he's actually in the land of Midian herding sheep. And that is a long way from the Nile River. But God says it is time. And God has a plan. It's time to answer uh, this, the, the promise, to answer the cry of my people. And so he goes to this very unlikely, unsuspecting person. He's kind of an old man. He's 80 years old. And he's pretty reluctant to want to go. He says, I'm not a good public speaker. I really don't think you want me to go and talk to Pharaoh and tell him what you want me to say. But he, God is uh, persistent in saying, no, you will go and you will be the conduit for me to speak to the people and to do miraculous things in delivering them from slavery. Well, Moses goes uh, to Pharaoh, but right from the jump, uh, things don't start well. He, he goes to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh not only says, no, I'm not going to let him go, God bless you, but no, I'm also, I'm also going to make their burdens even harder. I'm going to be a harder taskmaster on these slaves. And so Moses cries out to God, why did you send me here? This is not going according to plan. You say, I'm going to go to hell Pharaoh, let my people go. I'm going to just march into Pharaoh's court. Hey, the Lord said, let my people go. All right, we're out of here. That's not how it went down. And Moses is like, what's going on? They're laughing at me. They've made the, the work of the people even harsher than it was before I came down here. I've made it worse. And God, by the way, you still haven't delivered the people. Well, God, God is unfazed by Moses' skepticism, Moses' uh, complaints. He says, listen up. I... 
you will see what I will do to Pharaoh because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he's actually going to drive them out. He's going to want to get rid of you so badly. And sure enough, that's exactly what God did. God sent the 10 plagues. The 10 plagues I kind of referenced at the beginning. Amazing, miraculous things of, of, of destruction and awe and power from, from God. And each one, we're not as familiar with today, but, but during the time, each one was really targeted at specific gods of the Egyptians. The Egyptians had a god that walked over to the, watched over the Nile River. Of course, that was their life source. And God just turns the whole Nile to blood. And on and on. He just knocks down their false gods to show who the true God is. Now, Pharaoh put up a good fight. Uh, a, a finite man tried to go to war with the infinite God. And at any time, Pharaoh could have relented. He could have been humble. He could have let the people go. And he came close a few times. Came close a few times, but it wasn't until his entire country was destroyed and his firstborn dead. He agreed to let the people go. But even then, only for a moment. As soon as the people of Israel get out into the desert, uh, Pharaoh pursues them with his army, changes his mind. No, 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 come back. You're my slaves. I'm not going to let you go. Uh, Israel running out into the, uh, trying to get out of Egypt. They get to the Red Sea, and geographically, they are completely trapped. They are hemmed in on mountains on, on both sides of them. The Red Sea is in front of them. The Egyptian army is nipping at their heels from behind. They are in an inescapable situation. You may say, why would God, who's promised to deliver them, let them get into a situation where there is no escape. Because over and over again, what we're gonna see is, it's not about what the people can do. It's not even about what Moses can do. It's always about what God, not only can, but will do. So God, uh, the people are afraid. Moses cries out to the Lord and the Lord gives him instruction. Take your staff, stretch it out, over the waters and a pillar of fiery cloud moves in behind them to separate the Egyptian army from them as a, a wall of protection as he raises his staff over the sea an east wind blows all night long until the waters are parted and even the the, the seabed becomes dry ground and the people of Israel cross over on dry ground on the seabed with walls of water beside them. They reach the other side. The, the army of uh, Egypt pursues them across the seabed, but there's confusion, there's malfunction of equipment, and then Moses turns around, and raises his staff again, and the waters return to where they were, destroying that mighty army of the dynasty of the day. And so the people are standing on the banks of the other side of the Red Sea, and they're like, wow, did you see that? <laughs> that was incredible. And they, they saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians. The people feared the Lord, and they put their trust in him. And that's what this was all about. God is allowing them to go through these hard situations, these situations where they can't control, Moses can't control. They have to depend on God. And over and over again, God comes through and God delivers them so that they will trust him. So they're standing on the banks. They write a song, the horse and the rider thrown into the sea. They're celebrating, they're singing, they're drinking, they're partying. They're saying, praise God, yoo-hoo, he saved us. And they're trusting him. But how long did that last? About a minute. It is. Because they turn around, they continue their journey through the desert, and of course they need water. Well, the first little oasis they come to, water's not potable. They call it bitter water. And so they cry out, we have no water to drink. What are we going to do? We're going to die here in the desert? It's like they've just forgotten what happened, what God did for them. They're not trusting. They're not depending on God to take care of them. So Moses cries out to the Lord, help us. The Lord says, 
take this stick, throw it in the water, water becomes sweet, it's potable, it's crystal clear, and all the people drink. Yay, yippee, praise God, praise Jesus, woohoo, life is great, we've been blessed, it's wonderful. Until about six weeks later, literally. About six weeks into the trip, they've run out of the food that they brought with them into Egypt, they're starting to get hungry, starting to be worried and afraid that they're not going to eat, they're just going to starve in the middle of this desert. Moses cries out to the Lord, and the Lord delivers them again. And he provides manna, that's a, a sustenance, daily, okay, six days a week for the next 40 years. Talk about breakfast in bed. They, they, they open their tent in the morning, and there's the manna on the ground to, to pick up and eat. Wow, yay, yippee, God has saved us. He's delivered us again. Praise Jesus. Until a few months later, and it's water again. If you live in the desert, you know how hard water is to get, how important it is. So right away, do they, do they start trusting? Oh, God's going to, no, they start grumbling again. They're complaining again. So Moses cries out to the Lord. The Lord says, take the staff that we use to part the Red Sea, go to this rock and hit the rock, and water's going to come out of it. And it's rock in front of the elders of Israel, and everybody saw it. Water is flowing. The people, the children, the livestock, they all drink. Yay, yippee! God is good. He saved us again. God is really trying to teach them to trust him. And as I read through uh, the book of Exodus, one of the things that came to my, my mind, uh, stood out to me, was that it's really important to remember if we're going to trust God. In order to trust God, it's kind of like the first step. Like we just have to remember all of the things that God's done for us before. It's so important to remember that in Moses' final words, this is the last speech that he gave before he died to the nation of Israel. He said, be careful and watch yourself closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them fade from your hearts. The yay, the joy, the yippee. Remember how joyful it was when God delivered us? Don't let that fade from your hearts just because of your present circumstances. Hold on to those things. Remember them as long as you live and teach them to your children and to their children after them. So, why is it so hard for us to remember? What is it about remembering the good things, remembering the times God has taken care of us that's so hard? Well, part of it is just natural instinct. It's kind of a survival instinct that God's given us. Our brains are naturally more focused on the problems of the present and even the fears of the future before we start looking back and reminiscing or remembering. We are so overwhelmed emotionally by the, what's on our plate today, overflowing with stuff to do and problems, and fear and worries about anything, anticipating anything that might happen on the horizon. To stop and remember. You know what? I've been in a jam before in my life. And guess what? God delivered me then. And guess what? God's going to deliver me today too. I got a great example of somebody who, who's set up a, a ritual. Uh, he was intentional about remembering a deliverance that God had given to him. It's a great story, but I can't tell the story as well as Paul Harvey can. So, just me two minutes. Now, the rest of up. the story. Every Friday evening about sunset on a lonely stretch along the east seacoast of Florida, you could see an old man white-haired, bushy-eyebrowed, slightly bent. Every Friday, one gnarled hand would be gripping the handle of a pail, a large bucket filled with shrimp, and there on a broken pier reddened by the setting sun, a weekly ritual would be reenacted. Seagulls come from nowhere on the same pilgrimage 
to meet the old man. And for half an hour or so, the gentleman would stand on the pier, surrounded by fluttering white, till his pail of shrimp was empty. October 1942. Captain Eddie Rickenbacker was lost at sea. He had been on a mission to General Douglas MacArthur, and somewhere over the South Pacific, his flying fortress got lost, got beyond the reach of radio, fuel ran dangerously low, the men ditched their plane in the ocean. For nearly a month, nearly a month, Captain Eddie and his companions fought the water and the weather and the scorching sun, spent sleepless nights recoiling as giant sharks rammed the rafts, but of all of their enemies at sea, one proved most formidable, starvation. Eight days out, their rations long gone or destroyed by the salt water, it would take a miracle to sustain them. And a miracle occurred. In Captain Eddie's own words, and I'm quoting now, Cherry, that would be the B-17 pilot, Captain William Cherry, read the service that afternoon. We finished with a prayer for deliverance and a hymn of praise. There was some talk, but it tapered off in the oppressive heat. With my hat pulled down over on my eyes to keep out some of the glare, I dozed off. Now remember, this is still Captain Eddie speaking. Something landed on my head. I knew that it was a seagull. I don't know how I knew, I just knew. And everybody else knew too. No one said a word, but peering out from under my hat brim without moving my head, I could see the expression on their faces. They were staring at that gull. The gull meant food, if I could catch it. Well, the rest, as they say, is history. Captain Eddie caught the gull. Its flesh was eaten. Its intestines were used for bait to catch fish. The survivors were sustained. Their hopes renewed because a lone seagull, uncharacteristically hundreds of miles from land, offered itself as a sacrifice. You know, of course, that Captain Eddie made it. Now you also know that he never forgot because every Friday evening about sunset, on a lonely stretch along the East Florida sea coast, you could see the old man walking, white-haired and bushy-eyebrowed and slightly bent for all of his remaining years. His bucket would be filled with shrimp to feed the gulls, to remember that one gull who on a day long past gave itself without a struggle as mana in the wilderness. And so now you know the rest of the story. Yeah, okay, some of you know that. Like manna in the wilderness. And Captain Eddie had this ritual every Friday, every, every day, uh, one day a week, one hour probably, right? Get the shrimp, drive down to the pier, feed them half an hour, drive home. Just one hour a week, a ritual. And I think he did this out of a deep sense of obligation and profound gratitude. And think what balance this brought to his life. Think about the perspective he had during the week when something went wrong, he had a flat tire, or he got in a fight with his wife, or it was, oh wow, you know what? Well, first of all, at least I'm not floating in a raft in the middle of the South Pacific. But even there, God sees me. God hears my cry for help, and God delivered me. I remember, so I can trust that he's going to deliver me today. It's hard for us to re remember that's the key to trust in God. It helps that we are intentional. If only we had some such ritual, one hour on the same day every week, coming together to hear God's word spoken to us, God's love showered down upon us. So important to give your life balance, to give your life a perspective, to not forget all the good things that God has done for you. Now you may say, well, wait a second. What am I going to forget? I actually never experienced it. I mean, the Israelites, the Israelites, they, they saw the fiery, cloudy pillar. They, they felt the wind blowing all night long. They heard the bubbling water as it, as it walled around them. Or Captain Eddie floating in the raft. He, he lived that. He experienced it. He, he could smell the salt water. He could feel the bird landing on his head. He could probably still today taste the flesh that sustained him. Well, way back on Good Friday, when Jesus died for our sins, 
You know, I didn't see Jesus nailed to the cross. I didn't hear his mom wailing at the foot of the cross. And on Easter Sunday, I didn't get to feel the scars in his hand and his side of his resurrected body alive forevermore. I didn't hear the shouts of jubilation from all his friends to see him alive again. I haven't experienced it, so what is there for me to remember? Well, yes, you have experienced God. You've experienced the creator when you walk outside and you feel the warmth of the sunshine, when you smell and taste the food that you enjoy. Let's be honest, most of us eat for leisure, beyond just substance, if you eat more than one meal a day, right? You eat because you enjoy it. And these are blessings that our creator has given to us. And even more than that, God, our savior, comes to deliver his gifts to us of forgiveness, faith, trust, eternal life in real ways that we experience. We hear God's word when it's spoken to us, when Ed read it, in a minute when the children sing God's word. God is speaking to us through all of these people. And in baptism, we could hear the water as it dripped back into the font. And little Cruz could feel that cold water dripping off of his forehead. And in communion, you can smell the wine, you can taste the bread. And God does this so that we do experience it. And he does this frequently so that we don't forget. Let's not forget. You can trust the you can trust God, whatever situation you're in. And if you're going through a dark season right now, I can tell you that God is going to use it to grow your faith to show you how he will deliver you again and again and again so that you can live in peace and so that you can share that with your children and with their children after them. Amen? Amen. All right, let me say a quick prayer and we'll have the preschool kids come up and sing to the Lord for us. Heavenly Father, thanks for this beautiful day and all the gifts that you shower down upon us. Pray that we never take your gifts for granted as numerous as they are, uh, we are so overwhelmed by your power and we're so overwhelmed by your love. Uh, Thank you for taking care of us, for delivering us uh, time and time again as we look back over our lives. So many instances we can point to and say, wow, if you hadn't stepped in, Lord, I would have been done for. Uh, Thank you for saving me and help us to trust you and not forget uh, this week and the days ahead. We pray your help and your blessings in Jesus' name, amen.